it is not it is simply not appropriate for us as men to simply tell the world and tell our women and tell everybody else that we we're only limited to what we can do because another man's going to decide what our outcome is going to be. I think that is the most pathetic shit in the world and it's embarrassing and uh, it honestly if I'm a black woman I'm like okay I want to be safe and protected but the man that's supposed to protect me is on his knees you know praising another man saying that it's 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 the other guy's decision whether we get to eat or not well you know he's not the man of my house that other guy's the man of my house welcome to harley initiated where real men talk real shit your host tyshawn jackson here again with my co-host ryan Catches. I'm liking that energy, bro. We're about to go crazy. I'm just feeding off the table right yeah. now. Yeah. Right Ladies, now. look at your screens right now. Oh this is it's goodness. real. Great black men do exist. It's <laughs> right <laughs> here in front of you today. Facts. And I've been working on this intro all day. I ain't gonna lie to you. I've been working on this intro. <laughs> Muscle up all on day them. Muscle long. up on them. Because we rock it here with one of the top black financial revolutionaries. I would say of our entire generation, especially my generation. Look at that brother right there. We rocking with Dr. Boyce Watkins. And yes, Thank I'm you. not even done, all right? I'm not even done. And I got to talk about, this is a full circle moment, by the way. I was actually a student of the Black Business School, which led me wow. into real estate, which led me to meet Ryan, which yep. actually <laughs> led us to put the podcast together. Are you serious? And we, all wow. of this... Is literally fruits. Man. I would even say of that first step of the journey. So Insane. major full, that's major full circle moment. That's by a, the way, that's a dream come true for me. That's what that, that's what I that's it, the vision I have. I think black men are supposed to be at the top of the world, you know. And I feel like uh, what like seeing this just reminds me that it was worth the energy, you know. Because when I jumped in and started doing this stuff, you know, it's kind of kind of about myself, you know what I mean. And I was like, no, nah, but we're, I'm going to help hopefully wake some of us up. And get us to see our greatness, and uh, I'm I'm proud of you, man. I'm woke. I, I saw the podcast. I said, "This is good. <laughs> this is good." <laughs> we so, like that. So I'm we honored to it. be here, brother. Thank man, you. Man, no, me. I'm honored to, to to have you here. It's a blessing. I'm also honored to have the brother sit next to you because this is a powerful brother. Y'all gonna get to know him today. If you don't, this brother here is. I'm talking. You go all the way back. You were ex NFL player. Transitioned out of it gained and re I mean the, to be able to to establish an identity after the NFL is a tough thing but I mean I would say you you have well exceeded just establishing an identity an identity and even evolved into this author this speaker this thought leader this person now who's inspiring many even myself young brothers all around the globe and we sitting here with Stevie Bags the coolest name I've heard all damn year. <laughs> Made for TV. Stevie Made Bags. For TV. Bags. Welcome to the show, brother. Thank you, brothers, for having me. I'm honored to be here with uh, brother Dr. Boyce Watkins. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's been just amazing energy so far. So I'm looking forward to the conversation and, and hoping hopefully I can gain something and also give some. Yeah. And, and listen, we got a lot of ladies that watch, but but this one I, I really wanna I really wanna do something special for the fellas. Okay. Because we got some great brothers here at the table. Some very powerful brothers that have achieved a lot, and I would say have really set the been examples for what many of us need to do in your own right. And I want to talk about some major things that um, is echoing through the the world of social media and the world right now that I want to bring some clarity from and get some real perspective. And you know, as men right now, I would say, especially black men, you look at you know, a lot of these statistics on suicide rates, you know, on stress, on depression. It's a, it's a lot, a lot of that is happening to us right now in what we also call one of the, probably one of the, the easiest times ever to get rich, mm -hmm. right? One, probably one of the, the most abundant times relative to history that we have, we still facing all this stress, trauma, and depression. It's really a crazy mix when you consider that. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, we've had this conversation a few times, I think with a a few other guys, but thankfully I'm, I'm even having your expertise here, especially Dr. Boyce, when we going into finance, because I think that's a big part mm -hmm. of our stress here as men. Yep. You hear these conversations all the time, especially the conversations of men feeling that they have to have this pressure yeah. to take on, especially the, the, the responsibility 
to drive the income of the home, right? Who should go 50-50? Who should run the household? Mm -hmm. Realistically, you a wealth building man, right? That's a big part of us having generational wealth and making a change. How should we really be structuring our homes and our families, especially in our community, for us to be able to have a healthy outlook? Should we be having the traditional mindset of the man pioneering and spearheading the income, or should we be looking at evolving how we think about uh, uh, structuring our families and finances in today's let, age. Let me start with the first part of your statement. You brought up something I think is very important. Uh, my wife, beautiful, intelligent black woman, she made me very much aware of suicide and various statistics on it. And uh, one of the theories I have about that is a lot of brothers um, are committing suicide, but it's not in the way, the traditional form of, I'm gonna just kill myself or whatever. It's slow suicide. You know, if I'm sitting around and I'm drinking every day and I'm doing reckless things in the street that might get me killed or just doing things that show I don't value my life, that's another form of suicide. And I, and I think about a lyric that Tupac had a long time ago where he said, it was on, uh, only God can judge me, where he said, no more hesitation, each and every black male's trapped. And they wonder why we suicide or run around strapped. Mm. And I think about that word trapped, mm. right? And we talk about the trap a lot, being in the trap, living mm -hmm. in the trap, right? We, we glorify that trap. But one thing about the trap that you have to understand is that uh, when they studied rats, uh, they could measure how depressed they were with the serotonin in their brain. So they had one group of rats where they were trapped. They would get electric shocks, and they couldn't stop it. it was just, they would just go through a lot of pain. There was no way to remedy it. They had another group of rats that had, a, had an out. They had an option. Right, so when they would get shocked, they could hit a lever and make the shock stop. So mm -hmm. then they measured the serotonin, they measured the, how depressed they were. Mm -hmm. The rats that were trapped were far more depressed than the rats that were not trapped. So uh, if you go back to words like trap or the other side of that, which would be options or freedom, the more options and freedom you have, the less trapped you feel, the better your mental health tends to be. Why? Well, because when you're going through a tough situation, you can make it better. And so when you talk about the remedy or, or the, the, the problem and the solution, I think a lot of brothers are trapped. Largely, you talk about the economic piece. You think about this, right? You grow up in a world where you're pretty much taught that your only way of getting ahead economically is hoping that a white man one day gives you a job, which is just the most subservient bullshit <laughs> I've ever seen. Like, literally, it's like he's the alpha, you're the beta. You go to church, you're praying to, to Jesus. Please help me get a job. But really, the white man's like, well, boy, I'll give you an opportunity. <laughs> you know, and so, so he's really your God. You really just go, just go pray to him. Not, you know? and, and, and I think that that is a terrible, just demoralizing way to live because not every man is meant to be just uh, somebody else's beta male. Some of our men are meant to lead, right? So, uh, it, so one of the simple solutions would be, I believe every black child in, in this country should learn how to start a business by the age of 12, they should have somebody investing in the stock market for them when they're born, before they're born even. And then everybody should understand things like real estate. Like I was talking to my brother earlier today. He said uh, he's a great athlete. You can see that, right? He's, he's been very successful. And, and I, I was really impressed because he said, if I had taken all that same energy I put into being great at football and applied it to, imagine if I applied it to real estate and entrepreneurship and everything else. And then imagine if you got 10 million black boys to do that. Right. Well, we still play our sports. We we're gonna be great at sports no matter what. Right. right. A lot of us were athletes. I was. D was. A lot of us were. Mm -hmm. But it's like just take that energy and just say everything I do, I'm gonna be a winner at. Right. Mm -hmm. So so uh, because being a winner in life, uh, what makes you feel like a winner as a man is to have whatever you define as success. Right. Money is a big part of that. So I think that should be incorporated just generally into the culture. Where you know, like uh, for example, I, I think Michael Jordan is a, a decent example of this because. Michael was a winner on the court, but he was a bigger winner off the court because what he does in business, he wants to win championships. He's still winning. He's winning bigger championships, making a billion yeah. dollars a year down there, right? So, so ultimately, I would say that's the first step is building our men into what we're supposed to be instead of having this stupid ceiling over our head that doesn't have to really be there, right? Because we want to say, well, it's racism. You know, they won't let us learn this and learn that. I get that. That's real. But... I've never met a white man who told me that I couldn't read a book. You know, I've never met a white man who told me I couldn't fill out an LLC form and start a business. I never met a white man who told me I couldn't take care of my kids. 
You know, so I think that when we, as we talk about racism and all that, we got to be careful about falling so deep into a, almost like a boogeyman-ish kind of approach that we don't understand our personal power. I believe that any man, part of manhood, <clears throat> and I, you know, it's my, my, my simple definition of manhood is your ability to manifest your reality. Like you think about it in sports, that would be like a playmaker, right? A playmaker is a guy that can take an ordinary situation and find some way to make a play. Get the ball in the Deion Sanders could do it. Michael Jordan could do it, right? Mm -hmm. so, so if you are a man, if you really embrace your divinity, your masculinity, whatever you want to call it, you become a playmaker in your life. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and, and, and I had the fortune of learning that from my father, who was the kind of guy where whatever the situation called for, he said, I'll, I'll go make it happen. I'll go get, you need money, I'll go get it, right? So, so, so men having that mindset, I think it makes, uh, uh, it makes us better for our women better for our families, and, and you can just show up in a better way. And then at that point, you can get to the business of managing the, the relationship, which is definitely a whole nother conversation. Man, first of all, you answered my next two questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 but that was important, though, because you talk about why we feel in depressed, because we feel in trap, because we feel as though we don't have or we don't have the options, which is I'm, I'm assuming is the skills, the knowledge to be able to do this, which, I, which is why it's crazy to me. In my mind, we have just this information abundance, mm. right? We we I feel like it's there, but for some people, it just it just really doesn't seem that way. I, I, I want to know your thoughts on you know. Well, first of all, Stevie, personally, have you ever experienced depression? Absolutely. You almost have to be abnormal to not experience depression in America as a melanated man. Period. Depression. We talked about de oppression. Suppression leads to depression. So if you feel oppressed and suppressed, now you're going to be depressed. Depression is fear of your past. Anxiety is fear of your future. So if you're, if you're wavering between present, I mean, future and past, then you can't make sound choices in the, in the present. So now you're operating in a space where you're not, um, you're not being able to vibrate at your highest form. So how are you going to be a provider and a protector? Provision and protection starts first spiritually. It's not about your check. We, we are in spiritual um, slavery. We're spiritually, our credit score spiritually is bad as a people. Like, what's your credit score with God, mm. right? Like, what's your economic credit score is one thing, but what's your spiritual <clears throat> credit score? So to me, we, were, we, we live in the land of the fee and the home of the slave. I say that again. We live in the land of the fee, the home of the slave. Like, that's what we're dealing with, bro. So as a melanated man, we, we are fighting such a large war. And then, then you come and you couple that with the hate that we spew towards one another, that we've been programmed and conditioned to spew towards one another. How do you get out of that? How, for me, I, had, I learned that money wasn't power and education is not power. I learned that information was power. And if I got good information, I can display good power. If I got bad information, I'll display bad power. Unfortunately, many are called, but few are chosen. We want to have this whole world where everybody's going to pick uh, truth over tradition or pick righteousness over religion, but we don't live in that world. People will pick their truth, their, their tradition over truth. If I tell you Easter bunnies don't lay eggs, chickens lay eggs, but you still want to go celebrate fucking Easter, huh. that's your problem. <laughs> if I tell you respell Santa, it's Satan, and you go spend your money on, and be broke trying to give your child a gift when you give them love throughout the whole year, that's to me, that's insane, insane, right? But you go get somebody else wealthy and rich, and you're still poor. That all to me, I go. I'm I'm a spiritual activist. I'm not a black activist. I'm I'm talking about the STDs we're dealing with, spiritually transmitted diseases. That's why we're economically not in the place we need to be because we have taken our spirit has been taken away from us. You when you lose, when you take the spirit of a man, then it, you can do whatever you want with him. And when you when you uh, refer to spirituality, you mean religion, or is there is there a difference between spirituality and religion? Absolutely, for you? Is a there okay. is a difference because what can my religion do for me that God can't do for me? How can I put God, the universal God, to me? I call God Yahweh, but how can I put Yahweh in a box when Yahweh created the box? So when ha when if you look at I, I'm an etymologist, and if you look at these words, if you look at the word religion in the middle of the word religion is lie, in the middle of the word television should read television. So television and pop culture and religion shape your belief system. In the middle of the word belief is lie. 
Now, if we should know the truth and the truth shall make us free, why are we not free? Because we've been lied to. And if you have, if you have to believe in something or you have to have faith in something, then you don't know that. See, I don't have faith in God and I don't believe in y'all. I know y'all is real. So I, ha I have faith that if I get on this plane and I take this trip, that I'm going to make it. I have faith that, man, I hope I have a good month this month with business. I have faith in that. I don't have faith in the creator, bro, because I know I'm not self-created. I know if I fall off a building, I'm coming down. You might not want to call it gravity, but you're coming down. So when I find the creator, I find y'all in things that are inarguable. That's where spirit lies for me, in the inarguable things. You go to the beach, that sun gonna come, that beach gonna, that tide gonna flow without our discretion. <laughs> that sun gonna rise without your opinion. And you look in your own body. Your autonomic nervous system is gonna work automatically without your help. Hey, pancreas, liver, heart, colon, turn off. You can't do that. Now you can tell your arm to do this. That's your central nervous system. Your autonom autom autonomic nervous system is gonna work automatically without your help. So when we start to tap into things that are inarguable, to me, that's where you find your spirit. That's where you find your God. But until then, we're gonna be we're gonna be always behind the eight ball, and especially in a system that wasn't created for you in the first place. How can you be mad at a system that wasn't created for you in the first place? You gotta learn how to educate, liberate, and vacate that system. Unfortunately, we educate, assimilate to the system, and then we don't do the right thing. We we can never bring back the information to our people. You see what I'm saying? So like. This is why the information on how to be wealthy and how to be um, healthy is not readily, it's available, but people don't want to find it because the mind has been so shut off from receiving truth. If I'm taught, if, if, if everything is dead, TV, the TV's dead, the religion is dead, the food is dead, the government's dead, uh, the education system is dead, I think I said that already, but if all these power structures are dead, if somebody comes to speak life, it's not palatable to them. If you speak into a person who eat McDonald's every day and you tell them to eat kale, they're looking at you like you're crazy. <laughs> right. Right? So that right. imagine that in, a, in economics. Imagine that politically, socially, spiritually. You're having a conversation with someone who's the walking dead. So that's why I said many are called, few are chosen. As a matter of fact, in this age that we're in, the age of Aquarius, everybody's going to be called, but everybody's still not going to choose because it's not for everybody to choose, bro. Unfortunately, it's going to be so many people that are literally going to get left behind because they rather choose tradition over truth. Mm -hmm. So at this point, when, when you considering at the place you was in, when you were depressed, mm -hmm. you was in that spot, I guess is, um, it's a place that you kind of get stuck in, kind of get trapped in, right? Mm -hmm. With, what was it that pulled you out of it? Was Because you described this spiritual warfare that's taking place. Did you tap into something there? Was it you focused and got your money right? Like, what were the, the, the steps as a man that you took to kind of reel yourself right up out of there? I, I had to do self-inventory. Like, anytime something good happens in our life, we always want to take credit. Well, I got it out the mud. I'm self-made. <laughs> but when something bad happens, we point the finger outward. Yep. So what I stopped doing was going, pointing without, and I started going within. Like I always say this, the most powerful words in the English language starts with I-N, intellect, information, insecurities, insight, and you can keep going. If you don't go within, you're gonna always be depressed. If you don't go within, you're gonna always have anxiety because when you go within, you recognize, I can only control what I can control, homie. Whatever happens is gonna happen. Like, look, I'm, I have good intentions, so I planted good seeds, so, let man, hey, whatever happens, let's go. Because other than that, you're going to stress yourself out. That's why the heart attacks are here. That's why the inflammation is here. And that's why our people, young people are dying and sick. Because you're trying to chase this American dream, and then you find out it's the American scheme. Mm -hmm. And now, you, now you're like, dang, I got this money. I'm, I'm wealthy, and I feel good, and I got a degree. And like I said before, we perish for a lack of knowledge. Not a lack of degrees. Not a lack of money. Not a lack of swag. We perishing for a lack of knowledge. And knowledge is not knowledge unless you apply it. Knowledge is not knowledge unless you're sharing it. So that, that's where I'm at with that. And that's what I did. I went within, bro, in order to, 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 to get all the distractions out of the way. Because distraction comes before destruction. Yeah. 
Boys, I want to ask you this because uh, we recently had a, a guest on the show who had a, I think it was an amazing episode, Steve Eckert. Mm-hmm. And Steve Eckert, you know, white, very traditional, oh, mili- seen, mili- military man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, he sent me a note on Instagram. He follows me now. I follow, I, I That's follow dope. Yeah. That's dope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has a very no-nonsense approach when it comes to discipline, when it comes to manhood, manhood all those kind of things. And um, he made some very interesting comments, you know, or uh, we had some very interesting inf- uh, reels we put out on him. And you actually agree with him to a certain extent Mm -hmm. about black people having an advantage when it comes to being able to achieve success because of the hardships that we face. So I'm just very curious. What are your general thoughts? Do you think that we as black people have an advantage or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I I think that we have uh, unique unique skills and abilities that we do not see. Uh, What my brother was talking about was so great because uh, when you talk about depression, let's start there. I remember middle school and high school was very hard for me, very dark for me. I, 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 I can't even really remember. I can remember every single thing I did since the age of 18. I can't remember before that because it was a tough time. Mm-hmm. And when I reflect on that time and why I was dealing with so much depression, a lot of it started with the, a simple, very powerful word called love. Um, I had not been taught how to love myself. You know, I didn't uh, see my worth. I didn't see my power. I didn't see anything, you know. And uh, what climbed me out of that was when I started just doing that reflection and and learning what self-love looks like, which then then translates to things like self-confidence. So, for example, today, to this day, I, I can say things that I know might be wrong. I might embarrass myself. I might fuck it up. I don't care because I love me. I'm cool with boys. <laughs> I know yeah. boys messes up sometimes, but it's all right. You know, and that translates into like, okay, whatever. It's going to be what it's going to be. Like, like my man said, you know, and, and, and so, so speaking on that, uh, when you talk about the de- depression issue and, and then we, we, you get to where, uh, what Steve was talking about, I think that there's something that is missing that we're kind of losing or we've lost in terms of manhood where, it is not appropriate for a black or melanated man to. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not. It is not. It is simply not appropriate for us as men to simply tell the world and tell our women and tell everybody else that we we're only limited to what we can do because another man's going to decide what our outcome is going to be. I think that is the most pathetic shit in the world, and it's embarrassing, and uh, it. Honestly, if I'm a black woman, I'm like, okay, I want to be safe and protected. But the man that's supposed to protect me is on his knees, you know, praising another man, saying that it's, it's, it's the other guy's decision whether we get to eat or not. Well, you know, he's not the man in my house. That other guy's the man in my house. You know, if, if you, you know, when you talk about this just from a real competitive standpoint, um, there's something to be said about committing to doing your best. I think feelings are very important. <clears throat> Emotions are very important. I think men should process their feelings. That's why I love my therapist. I love, you know, I love talking to my wife. I married a therapist, right? Because I, I know I need <laughs> therapy. I've been traumatized like crazy. <laughs> but I also understand that I was born in a war. Come on. You know, I, I was, my mother was 16. She got pregnant with me, and there was nobody in the hospital waiting on me. You know, I was born on Father's Day. My father was nowhere to be found. And uh, my mother could, should, they, they, they probably, you know, they told her to abort me, you know, because we believe poor women shouldn't have babies or whatever. And, uh, mm. and so they didn't want me to be born. I went through the school system. They didn't want me to become what I am now. They wanted me to think that I was something else, either a thug or an athlete or whatever, right? And, uh, and I just found myself. I kind of found my way. And so when you're in a war, <clears throat> you, can't, you can't just punk out every time things get hard. Mm. You know, there's a point where you have to. <clears throat> understand, and I think fathers teach this, and when we lost our fathers, we lost this. Uh, strong fathers teach you, you know, when you're in the heat of battle, you got to focus on the battle. Like, whether you're talking about an actual war, <laughs> you, know, you can't be in the middle of the battlefield crying because you're scared of getting shot. Mm. You, gotta, you got a job to do. You know, or if you talk about trying to win a championship in sports, you know, you, you can't sit and get sad about the situation. You have to solve the problem and try to win, mm-hmm. because if you don't, you will lose. So, uh, so to some extent, part of overcoming 
that depression really comes from tapping into your masculinity because that is where your testosterone resides and testosterone is a natural antidepressant. So that means mm. look, basic, mm. it could be, it could just start with basic things, getting up, going to work, working out, you know, little things like that have a huge impact on your mental health. And then also just, you know, reminding yourself that, that there are things, there's always something you can do. There's always something, some place where you can take accountability, say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work on this. I'm going to do my best. And I think that what that does is it makes the world respect you more and it makes the women respect you more. I think, I, I know a lot of black women that don't need you to make a lot of money. They don't need you to be rich, but they want to see the man get up and work. They want to see him try, right? They, they don't want to see him buckling up like a bitch every time, you know, the family goes through something mm. because that's not going to make her feel safe. So, uh, so ultimately, I think that when we're talking about dealing with the depression of black men, yes, we must deal with the emotional side. That's very important. You got to nurture those emotions, work through that, all that stuff. Again, I'm a big advocate of therapy, but then you also must have the warrior in you. And, uh, and I'll, say, I'll tell you where I get this from. I had the privilege of having a father who was a soldier. And when I see my father go through something really difficult, I'll say, well, how does that make you feel? And he'll say, well, right now my feelings don't matter. I got a job to do. And then the feelings, you deal with the feelings later. You know what I'm saying? And I think it's okay to say it's not politically correct, but I think as men in our conversation, that's what we have to kind of talk to each other about. Just no, do, bro, just I want to interject on that. Please, to your ahead. point, I think we get caught up in feelings over facts. We get caught up in the feelings over facts. And so if you think about No Child Left Behind, that was a thing based on, upon upon. Children having, oh, I don't want to hurt their what? Feelings. Right, 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 right. So everybody who shows up, you didn't win the race, but you got a fucking medal. That is not real life. So many fake winners have created real life losers. And them the same people who try to rob you at the gas station. Because they pretend like, well, you got the medal around your neck. I want that medal. Or you driving that metal car, and I'm finna make you lay it down. That's what we deal with. Because so many fake winners have created real losers. To me... Listen, I want to know that you're not abused. You're not, I, I love you. Like when my parents used to get on my ass and give me a spanking, I beat you because I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? When, when I look back, that template wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> I look at all the people that I went to school with that didn't get whippings and spankings, and I look at what they've accomplished and achieved. I don't want to trade places with them. Straight up. But because society tells us that we have to adhere to this fairy tale world, but that's not real. You, my daughter, baby, you're beautiful. But guess what? You got to earn every got doggone thing you get on this planet. Mm -hmm. Don't nobody owe you nothing because you're pretty and you got to between your legs. Okay? Son, you have to be dynamic in every single way. I'm sorry. Right? And you ain't just got to be an athlete, artist, entertainer, dope boy, stripper because the wealthiest people in the world don't go to play sports and they don't go to college. They create things. So when we start telling our children this and we stop celebrating what society gives us to tell them, like I was telling, I was telling boys earlier, if you send your child to Rome, why do you think they, why, why are you mad that they come back acting Roman? Mm -hmm. you, you, like, you sent them off there to educate your children to tell them a lie. They will never tell your children about Mansa Musa and Halas Halasi. They will never tell them about the opulence they possess. They will only tell them that they come from slavery. Well, we more than that. Well, well, we don't know that. Where, where are the movies about Mesa Musa and Marcus Garvey? Where are those movies? But we have Wakanda Forever. But we don't have that. Mm -hmm. Them real life heroes. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? When a man could ride a lion like a horse, Haile Selassie wrote, did that. But they don't, we don't know those stories. And our babies only don't know that stuff. So the only thing they want to wow. do is, man, I want to be like LeBron. Man, I'm in the hood, but I want to be like Kobe. Let me tell you this, too, about equality. Equality is not real. We, if people think equality is real, go to nature. The bigger, the badder the lion, the more lionesses he got. That's life. You do, I mean, what are we talking about here? <laughs> if everybody was equal, we could all dunk like Kobe. So, hold on, I got a question for you. You could all spit yeah, like, you know yeah. what I'm saying? I, 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 like D1, you could all spit <laughs> like D1. That's a fact. I'm but very curious every, about this approach yeah, go you ahead. got. I'm curious about this approach because uh, what's the young lady who said that she wouldn't marry the guy who drives a bus unless he owns Ebony, the bus? Ebony, Ebony Williams. Ebony, Ebony, Ebony Williams. Yeah. So I'm very curious because, you know, you, you're saying, hey, you tell your sons, you got to go out there to be dynamic. You got to be, you know, this great man. But then you have men out there that are, that are saying, hey, women are wanting too much. 
So do you think that women want too much or is it men that need to put in more work to, to satisfy these women? You don't have what you want because you're not what you want. I'm going to say that first. In anything in life, if you don't have what you want, it's because you're not what you want yet. Okay, so woman, you want a man that own the bus, but are you that value of a woman to receive that? Because you attract everything you are. See, this is what I'm saying. Like, like everything that you are comes to you, but you won't, what's for you won't pass you, but you might pass it. So men, men don't have to do more and women don't have to do less. We just have to get in our order, in our lane. See, nowadays men acting like women and women acting like men, and that's the problem. Everything is out of order. So men are castrated. The next time I hear a man say, happy wife, happy life, I want to slap the shit out of him. Excuse my <laughs> it's happy us or get off the bus. For real. We both, we, this all should be synergy over here. If, especially if I got to deal with the pressure of being the provider and protector, not just even if it's not a sole provision and protection. Because let's face it, they'll pay a melanated woman before they pay a melanated man yeah, nowadays. Will. Now, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me get you right there because that was a traditional, that was some, you, 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 you low key like a little anti tradition. And that's some traditional shit that a man is supposed to be the provider and the protector, right? Now, this kind of goes back to my original question. Do you feel that that's tradition or is that just universal nature? That a man is supposed to be looking to be taking on this role and to be putting that pressure and that stress on his back to be providing, getting the bacon and being the breadwinner of his family. Can I go back to nature? I, I love lions. I'm from the tribe of Yehuda, so I love lions. But when you look at the lioness, the lioness hunts. The lioness go do, does the hunting because she pays attention to detail more. She's... Her intuition is better than a man. Our anatomy is outer. Their anatomy is inner. So the, what I do well, I keep them hyenas off your ass when it's time to eat. That's what I do well, right? She does the hunting. But once again, if we don't look at this warfare that we're dealing with and start to really be st strategically in the way we attack it, they'll, all, they'll kill us because now a woman who makes more than a brother, she a, she a little boy him. See what I'm saying? A lot of women, especially melanated women, they will little boy you if they make more money than you. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You see what I'm saying? Black black women, I think we were talking, me and Tashawn were talking about this. Black women, their standard is a lot different. Like, you wouldn't see a traditional black woman with, like, a what would you consider, like, a nerd or, no. like, a gamer or something like that. But even in other races, you know, you, the gamers and the nerds, they would, you know, you know, <laughs> beautiful, what you, what you would call traditional women. So I think black women's standard in general for, like, bitch assness or anything remotely close to it, whether, you know, it's inner or it's, it comes out, like they just have zero tolerance for it. I think it's, I think you got to also start with that word earlier. He was mentioning in, you know, looking inward uh, in terms of what you're attracting, what you're pursuing. Um, you know, I can say I, I, from my experience, every relationship has its own rules and you and that person are the ones who decide how that's going to work that's based on what you're showing up at, to the table with, you know, and I think that this idea that somehow we can go on the internet and listen to fake ass gurus telling us who, who ain't who got shitty relationships themselves, <laughs> you know, tell us like, oh well, you shouldn't, you should always do this and you should never do that, and women ain't this and men ain't that. Nah. That's bullshit, man. Yeah. That's that's just the dumbest stuff I've ever seen in my life. And I think that intelligent people, we have, if you really want to look at what's happened in our community, we've been thrown off balance. One of the reasons I'm, that I, I'll just never forgive Joe Biden is because <clears throat> that crime bill and then the way they destroyed hip hop music and the way they put all the drugs in our community, that just created an ecosystem imbalance like animals. It was the, the Economist wrote a deep article about African-Americans and how the community was disrupted because they put so many men in prison. Mm -hmm. They said that the, for every 1% increase in the incarceration rate, there was a 2.5% decline in the percentage of black women who got married. And what that did wow. was, it, what happens is when you imbalance the ecosystem, it changes everybody's behavior. So the men who got you know, options, you know, we like, oh shoot, I'm the man, I could have 10 girlfriends if I want to. And the women you know, are like, well, okay, well, do I gotta wear a shorter skirt? Do I gotta act like the hoes? You know, whatever, mm. to, in order to get a man's attention. Mm. And it just creates this chaos, you know? So that's what we're in the middle of, right? So uh, it, you know, understanding that, I think at that point, it, it's really a matter of, I think, just being realistic in terms of what you're dealing with. So let's talk about Ebony K. Williams. 
Um, first of all, I didn't. I, did, I thought that was an unfair question for the ass uh, to be asked on, on that show. Like what? The, you know, the interview wasn't even about her. She, but you know, Ayanna's like, well, would you date a bus driver? I, I, you know, I would have said, well, it's none of your business. You know, but but she, you know, right? I, because that's a good question. It was a good right, question. that was kind of a mess. You know, but but she answered the question and she said, if he drove the bus. Let's be clear. It's her right to want that. Just like mm -hmm. it would be my right to say, you know, she got to have some ass. Or she got to mm -hmm. look good. You know, mm -hmm. I, we have preferences. Women have preferences. Yeah. Anybody can have whatever preferences they want. Nobody has a right to judge that. Oh, your standards are too high. This and the other. You don't know that. Like if I say, well, I, I, I work, but I, I need to make half a million a year. Well, maybe for some people that's very unrealistic. But this man, he's made millions of dollars. It may not be unrealistic for him, but he won. You know, so, so who you are determines what standards you can set. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're happy with the results, you're okay. It's like looking for a job. You know? like, so if, if I am happy with what I'm getting from the job market, like if I say, well, I'm, I'm not going to work for less than half a million, and people are offering me jobs at that rate, then that's a good thing. But if I'm not getting, if I'm unemployed, and I'm pissed <laughs> off, and I'm like, man, I got a whole GED, and I'm going to work three hours a week, and they still won't pay me half a million, somebody might say, based on your, what you're bringing to the table, your standards are too high. Mm. Right? You understand? It, it varies for, for person. But is it, realistic? is it realistic for us to come to some level of congruence and, and agreement if we give, if, you know, you, you encourage everybody to think in this wide variety of different ways? No. And, and here's the thing. I don't think Ebony K. Williams was telling anybody to agree with her. She just said, well, I want him to drive the bus or own the bus. Right? You know, no, I'm just saying with you, with you in general. So you're saying, you know, hey, whatever you do, you apply whatever philosophy works for you. So yeah. if everybody did that, I think we would all be complete. We all have different scripts which we live by, right? Yeah. yeah. Fig figure out what you want and then figure out how to get it. And then be honest with yourself when you're not getting what you want. You know, so, for example, I know a, a, a very nice lady, very attractive black woman who went to Harvard, um, a couple of daddy issues. Her father got killed when she was young, like 76 percent of the other people in our community. She had no father in her life. And her whole life, she says she's 50 years old. She's been looking for the right man for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, you, you date a new guy every four or five months, you know, and you had none of them are the right guy. And I just told her, I said, I think you're looking for something that doesn't exist you know, for you, you know, and, and so really, I think just deciding what you want. And then now she wanted to actually land a relationship. She would have to change something. She has to shift the standards. Maybe her standards are too high. Maybe she needs to work on something about herself to appeal to the right man in the right way. Right. But I think that that whole conversation went in a direction that was too general. And where Ebony K. Williams went off the rails was when she tried to define her statement in a, in a very bad way by basically saying, I'm challenging black men to be excellent. And this is all about mm -hmm. black men and black men not doing this. But you was engaged to the white guy. So you have no license to really mm. criticize black men because you're not even invested in us. Mm. I, I feel that being married to a black woman gives me a certain right to speak on black women because I can really? say I invested my life in a black woman. But, wow. but you got motherfuckers out here talking shit about black women who, ain't, who won't even date one. Mm. Wow. Like that, that's not appropriate to me. Yeah. You don't you're, you you need to be quiet at that point, in my opinion. You know, so 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 I think the whole conversation online is bad. Anybody who wants to know how to have a healthy relationship, in my opinion, go talk to somebody who's already got one. Talk to these married people. Talk to these people who have been married 30, 40 years. Learn the nuances of relationships that you may not have gotten because you never saw that growing up. Right. There's nuance to it. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you don't have uh, a model of, say, a father every day showing you what masculinity looks like in different forms and different situations, then you're going to get the wrong perception. So you, what mm. are you going to do? You might turn on the TV, mm. look at some rapper, you know, who got a liquor bottle in one hand and a gun in the other. And, and be like, oh, that, that's masculinity, right? Or putting on a dress yeah. or whatever, right? Think, like I had to add that, by the way. Right, right, right. Think, you know, <laughs> and you, be, you might be thinking, well, that's, that's masculinity. I need to be banging over bacon. I need to be a tough guy all the right. time. And you don't understand the nuance, you know. My father's a very tough man, but I saw him be very gentle to my mother. I saw my mother submit to my father. I saw my father submit to my mother because he loved this woman. It wasn't because he was a punk or a simp. It was because he, he understood that's his wife, right? So, so in a way, the, the analogy I would give to that is like, think about playing football. And imagine if I'd never spent much time learning how to play the game. I never know, learned the nuances of the game. So I'm thinking, okay, football players, they, they just run up and they hit people. 
So I get in the game, and every single play, I'm just trying to hit somebody. The referee blows a whistle. I run up, and I hit the referee. because I'm hitting people because I want to be a good football player. Well, he would explain to me, no, 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 you don't always hit the referee. When certain times, you, got, or you, don't hit, you never hit the referee, right? So, and you only hit the people on the other team. You know what I mean? Like, like there's times for you to be tough. There's times for you to be strategic. There's times you need to calm down and walk off the field. All that. Nuance, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of guys, don't, when they don't learn nuance, they put on these weird personas that are just toxic and very unhealthy. And so that's why manhood coaching is really important for our community. And womanhood, too. Same thing. Mm-hmm. Manhood coaching is is definitely something that um is is far and few. A big part of even why we started the the platform itself. When you consider most of the strongest communities, even you know going back historically, they always had some kind of rite of passage in the manhood. They always had some kind of initiation. Where now we are hardly initiated. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the show, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's yeah, how yeah, we yeah, yeah. and and here we are here uh-huh. now with you brothers and, and and coaching us up on this. You brought something up really. Really important to talk about, I think, and you know that's that's about people, you know, dating outside, you know, their race at this point. Mm-hmm. You got these people that want; they say, "I want these standards, and I want to be able to get these this kind of person." So, is it wrong if they're so willing to get this kind of person that is that they go outside of their race? Do, do you consider that to be a right or wrong thing, or should people just be looking to fight? with their people alongside, regardless of whatever that comes with. What's your I, philosophy on I that? I think question? it depends on the person. I think every, because because if I, if I was to say it's always wrong, I'd be insulting people in my own family who made different choices. You know, I think everybody has a right to make their own choice. Uh, when I was 16 and my mother explained to me some of the challenges that some of her friends had when it came to securing the kind of man they wanted, at 16, I just decided, okay, I, this is the battle I choose. I will not marry a woman who is not black. I'm just not going to do that. Now, why was that, by the way? Like, what made you stand on that? Because I love my mama. You know, I, I, I don't, and, and also it's easy for me because I think black women are the most beautiful women on the planet. I don't think any other race competes with black women, you know? And so, <clears throat> so that was easy for me. It was very simple. You know, if I didn't marry my wife, I would have married, I would have just married a different black woman, you know? But, but, uh, but fortunately, I got a chance to marry that, you know, that woman. And, and it's, and, and I think, so I, I think that we have to be careful about judging other people's choices uh, because we don't know what their situation is, what their battle is, you know. And, and I'm going to tell you like this, it's, uh, it's really heartbreaking when you, um, I can think of people in my family, I, I know someone who married a guy who was not black, but he treats her really well. He's a solid guy. He's a good person. So I have no issues with him. But then I know other people in my family who, dated black men who were just so bad that I would love to kill them, you know, just take them off the planet. Like literally okay. just like, I want to strangle you right now because you're, you're embarrassing all of us, you know? And I think that as black men, the real men, the good men have to stand up against some of the nonsense that we see out here. That's why I love rappers like D1 and stuff like that, who are really saying like, you can't just have men rapping and saying the most horrible things about women and glorifying things that are going to get us killed and sent to prison. We have to speak up against that. And it's hard because you get called a hater and all this other stuff. But I don't care, man. Some situations, I think you're not in this. Again, you're at war. So in a war, your goal is not to make friends. Your goal is to get the job done. So I'm, I'm, I don't care about making friends. You know, we, we know what's, what's right and what's wrong. And we know what this, this stuff has done to our people. We cannot allow this. Yeah. And Steve, what, what do you think about that in, in terms of uh, black men dating outside their race? Um, yeah, I think, I think to each their own. Because how, how I look at life is every one of your kind is not of your color, and every one of your color is not of your kind. Mm. I, I, I go back to spirit. You see what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm looking at the spirit of the thing because when I put my bullets in my gun, bro, unfortunately, it's for a nigga, a melanated brother <laughs> that was trying to kill me. I don't have a redneck or KKK person trying to attack me ever. Mm. They don't even play with me, matter of fact. The only person that plays with me is a person that looks like me. So, um, yeah, I don't blame a sister for going to date a white boy or any other culture or creed or what have you because we don't. And then her mindset has been so Hellenistic, Europeanized that she thinks that, you know, those standards, those are the standards, right? Like, once again, I, I'll pay for the meal. I'll open your car door. i do all that. But I can never be romantic because I'm not a Roman. I can never be a gentleman because I'm not a Gentile. Like, this is real talk. But baby, you want me to be romantic, 
But what if I ask you to do the same thing that the white girl does? She let her husband go do anything. His, his secretary is his mistress. As long as he take care of the house, he don't, she don't say nothing. When he goes golfing every day, all day, and he's gone from the house, he don't say nothing. Like, so you do the Roman thing too, babe. Then let's see how that works in your world. Mm. So, so let's have these conversations about the words. Once again, the programming, when you have a computer and you, down, you put a download a program, the program goes onto what? The hard drive. Mm. The hardest thing to do is to get rid of a seed that's been well planted in the brain. It's hard to drive out what's been put on your hard drive. You see what I'm saying? So if, 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 if my, my daughter at two years old, she was pushing around a baby carriage with a baby in it at two. So they've already told young women, if you don't have a, if you're not a mother, if you don't have a child, you nothing. So what if that woman who can't bear children, how does she feel about herself? Right? Mm -hmm. or, or the whole baby doll thing, right? The programming behind melanated children having white baby dolls. Mm. And looking at that as a, a form of, now I hate myself. Like this thing, bro, it's so, it's so deep, man. And it's so many layers of why our relationships don't work. Like a ship brings things to and from. <coughs> so if, if something is on my ship, if the things on my ship don't relate to the things on your ship, guess what? We can't have a relationship. If the parts on my ship don't connect to the parts on your ship, we can't have a what? A partnership. Partnership. Look at the look at the words that we're speaking. So we don't connect with our sisters no anymore, and they don't connect with us. Once again, it's out of order, and only only when we get back in order of our divine masculine and divine feminine spaces will we be able to be even comfortable enough having a conversation about why we don't why don't our relationships work in America? Well, let's talk about it. Marriage. We love marriage, the marriage talk. Uh-oh. So I was born before I had a birth certificate. I'm going to die before I have a death certificate. <clears throat> so I don't need a marriage certificate to validate my connection with you. Uh-oh. But on, society hold on, hold on, says wait. this. Hold on. You about to piss all the women off I, right I now. I can piss I them off. Know. They need to hear it. I already know you about to piss them off right now. Because <laughs> we, we done had this conversation before. We had a brother who said that same thing, who said that, you know, he didn't want his marriage and his connection and his... You know, the sanctity of the marriage itself to be validated by the government and so on and so forth, which I get that. Um, but a lot of women, they don't really. That's a false sense of security for them. Paperwork. Your word alone is just a false sense of security. Ty, we can have paperwork. We can have a, a, a we can have an insurance policy to make sure you straight if something happens to me or vice versa. We can we can create our own our own contract. I won't even I hate the word contract. That's what this is. What it is. The prefix to contract is con. I want a covenant. Fuck a contract, bro. I'm tired of contracts. We are covenant people, bro. And because we have not been standing no covenant, that's why these things don't work for us. Mm. So a ceremony and a certificate and a ring don't validate marriage. That's what society told you validates your marriage. So what, what does validate it? Connection. Consummation. So lady, when you sat down and opened your legs up to that brother, you was married to him. Not just him, 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 and him. I have plenty of wives, wow. bro. Wow. Because everybody I lay down with, that's my wife or my Ooh. concubine if I pay for it. But we don't have these conversations because we don't want to be real. And it hurt. The truth hurts. But the truth should make us free. So let's talk about how many husbands you got, babe, before you want to come put on a white dress and walk down the aisle with me. Mm. See, see, see. So these, let me, so let me, let me ahead, jump in here. Because it was, it's funny because Cobb actually said something interesting. If you remember when we interviewed him. Oh, he yeah, said there's yeah. no he said the the concept of divorce is a myth. That's what Kaba said. And he actually did say something very similar about the seed living in a woman. And when you consider that though, when you is it realistic though, Stevie, is it realistic to tell a woman that in order for her to be with you in marriage, life long term, are, are you are you a, are you a monogamous brother at all? I'm, I don't I don't think monogamy is natural at all. Okay. At all. And I mean, okay. no, no offense to anybody who practices that. But once again, I go back to nature. The bigger the batter the lion, the more lionesses he has. And it's a big lion over here. <laughs> no, and I'm not even talking about it by stature or by anything, this, this bro. This brother here probably could take down by six, no. seven. Man. <laughs> I don't even, bro, I don't even want to get the image. I don't want to get the image confused with the essence. It's the essence. Uh, what makes you a lion is not your bank account. What makes you a lion is not how big you are. What makes you a lion is, is uh, based upon your spirit, man, and based upon your intentions. Mm. You can't be a king unless you rule over your dome. Mm. 
That's how you can have a kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens is every man has a wife, but every king has queens, whether they want to admit it or not. Mm -hmm. Every woman has a husband, but every queen has kings, whether mm -hmm. they want to admit it or not. But once again, we've lost an indigenous way of looking at relationships. I don't even have all the answers, bro. I'm still mm -hmm. researching and studying myself mm -hmm. because the program that I was up under until, you know, 15 years ago maybe is, is what brought me to this place and this space. Now, now, now I'm curious to know because, boys, when it comes to marriage, I know marriage can be used as a wealth building tool <clears throat> in the community. Mm -hmm. Do you encourage marriage especially in our community with the state we at right now, damn near coming last in every economic statistic. Do you think that we should be intentional about marriage in a way to push us or propel us, you know, to, you know, be able to advance economically? I say it like this. It's a personal choice. And whatever direction you go, be very thoughtful about the pros and cons of that direction. Um, I can hear every perspective. I can hear what Stevie's saying. I, I understand where that's coming from. Um, I know people that are married. <clears throat> My father and mother were married for uh, almost 50 years. And one of the things that's, that's universally true is that wealth and power tend to be accumulated in some sort of group formation. There's some sort of uh, group or gang, almost like gang affiliation. <clears throat> you know, and, and uh, even even Apple, Apple Computer is a gang, right? They, they operate with the same code of conduct. They wear the same little emblems. They, they follow the same rules. And there's guidelines. If you break the rules, you get kicked out of the gang, right? The uh, NAFTA is a gang. Uh, the police department is a, is a gang. Uh, Asian Pacific Union is an economic gang, right? So black people are, are, and, and melanated people, we are the same. Uh, we lose because when they broke our families up, they had us out here as individuals trying to figure it all out, right? And so family matters. And what is a hard conversation is understanding things like, why is the divorce, divorce rate so high? Because uh, it, you know if you get married and then you get divorced, then yeah, your wealth is gonna drop. The average divorcee's wealth drops by 70%, both wow. the wife and the husband, and because the lawyers are getting all your money now, mm -hmm. right? And so, but, but at the same time, Let's say that you go the other route and you say, man, I'm not doing marriage because I, I don't want to. So if you let's say you have, you know, different women and, and you are lying, you know, and, and we know what it is. You get money and status and the women come. Um, well, you know, if you're not careful, that also creates some vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Number one, the child support system is a hell of a wealth killer uh, for the women. It's tough for them because the lowest median net worth in America is a single black mother with children. Right, so, so when we talk about men not being important, I think we need to look at how many people are struggling because you're doing a two-person job with, with just one person. So I would say to anybody, whatever decision they make, just know the differences and know the risks. And so for example, uh, when, uh, when I've been in scenarios where uh, women came around, even when I was single, I was very thoughtful and cautious about that because I, was, I would see men lose everything because they got accused of something they did not do. Mm. Or men who, uh, you remember Ime Udoka was with the Celtics and all the women coming after him. He's this big, tall, wealthy man, you know, and, 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 and all that. And, and, and he did nothing wrong, but yet they were talking about this man like he was a predator, like he was a rapist, you know. And that's the society that we live in, and I, and I, and I hate all that. I think that's crazy, honestly. Uh, so I think that black men have to just be cautious and thoughtful. And, and if you're trying to protect something, if you're building something and protecting something, you got to pick your teammates carefully. And, and then as you do that, you have to move carefully in terms of who you even allow into that circle. So, for example, if you are a man who is tempted to just chase after anything in the skirt, eventually one of those skirts is going to destroy you. Come on. You know, and so, so if you're not strategic, you're going down. Bad things will happen. And, and so, you know, I like my wife in large part because having my wife, it does keep me focused and she protects me. Other women stay away because they know, you know, and I talk about her deliberately in front of other people just so they know, look, I'm spoken for. So please just don't even distract me with stuff that's not going to be, uh, that's not going to fulfill the purpose that I've chosen for myself. The other thing I would say, too, is when you're building family relationships, anything you do, learn how to do that properly. You know, if you, if you are the man of the house and you're leading a household and whatever, there's books out there. There's, there's therapists out there. There's 
all kinds of counsel you can get, especially if you didn't see that growing up. Don't try to just feel your way through it because you're going to do it wrong. Uh, like when I was uh, younger, I, I read a book called What Women Want Men to Know. And it was just all about the mind of women and how women think. And, and honestly, I walked away thinking, man, women are weird. You know, like, like their brains just, the stuff that's normal to them is just crazy. But I learned to just sort of accept that and work with that, right? So, so, so learn just whatever strategy you take, study that strategy, do it well, manage your shit. Uh, if you, any man who loses discipline in any choice that he makes is ultimately going to be taken down. He's going to lose everything. And see, that's the, that's the thing when it comes to, I, I truly love the simplicity of monogamy, but I mean, if I'm just looking at the ability to, I, I mean, when I'm thinking about what polygamy does, I can just see as a man, it being a satisfying also model um, in different ways. But I, I haven't, the, the biggest problem with polygamy for me is I haven't seen really good examples of it. And I don't right. think, I don't really think any of us have truly seen good examples of it. So polygamy in most of our minds is just this, you know, this damn slut fest, right. you know, right. in, in, in <laughs> right. our minds. Right. It's, see, it's this perverted yeah. model of, of what's really happening. So, I mean, Steve, you're going to have an uphill battle. No, no. Listen, I'm not here to convert, convince, or coerce <laughs> nobody. I'm sure, yeah, I what I am it. here to do is to help have a different perspective because we look at polygyny some say polygamy, polygamy. I say polygyny, which is more of a righteous, holy perspective of it. If, we, if we're tribal people, we're village people. He's talking about gangs earlier. We are tribal people. We, we come from that kind of energy. We have adopted a Eurocentric ideology behind relationships. You belong to me, girl. Mm. No, you belong to y'all. You belong to the creator. I have to be a good steward over you while you're in my present, while you're mm. in, under my covering. So... Imagine a woman that's by herself that got a six hundred thousand dollar house, but she living by herself. Imagine the other woman that got a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar house living by herself, and so on and so forth. There's a scripture that says, "In that day, seven women should take hold of one man, and they should have their own bread and their own clothes." Now check this out. That sister knows how to pray better. That sister can cook better. That sister is is smarter with the uh, intellect, the education, the teacher. So now. All these children inside of this village mentality, they're getting better teaching. They're getting better love. How, how better can we rebuild a nation in a system that wasn't created for us that we see? The brothers, a lot of brothers ain't, can't even get qualified for a $700,000 house. And he go to work hard every day. But she does. But now if we take and turn that into another perspective, that seven, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 house, now we, we talking about some real money that we can make moves with and we can build something with. But most people don't want to hear that because you hear polygyny or polygamy, you just think about sex. All right. This is not just about sex. This is about nation building, wealth building. So if me and one could build something together, imagine how of all of us, if we really are mature and holy and righteous in our intentions behind this. But no, we that's hard for people to fathom, bro. That sounds like Tesla saying what he said back in the day. Oh, we can power the whole United States with just Niagara Falls. But now you got cars wow. named after Tesla. But he sounded crazy back then. Mm. So you sound crazy when you've been, the program is so strong. I get it. My, my mom hates that I think this way. Right? But I, but and, every, I always, and every other woman watching this, by the but way, too. I always, yeah, they do. <laughs> not, not all but, but no, you'd be very surprised, my brother, how not many women are opening up to the perspective of it because you can't, you can't expect us to keep doing the same thing and, and, and get didn't, this, this, one of the things that's happening on the west coast right now is that single moms are getting together and they're starting communes so they're like mm. they all living together yeah wow. all living mm. together raising well, families together well, yeah. you know i mean let's just be honest it's it's already happening it just people exactly. just don't say it you know, think they, about oh, they think sharing. About we this. sharing now. I mean, yeah, we right. sharing fathers but, 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 growing but, 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 up. You think, know, you right, in the but, neighborhood, you, you share a dad, the one dad. <laughs> everybody, yeah, everybody. Right, dad. right. I mean, it's it's it's, it's it happens. You know, man. It, I look at our granddads, bro. Look at our granddads and our granddads, <laughs> granddads. They had families and children all over the place, and not saying that was right. But you're not gonna you're not gonna fight against the nature of a man. I can mm. choose to do something. I can choose to eat vegetables every day, but that, that doesn't mean that I'm that I that my body needs. Fruit, mm. like come on, like I just, I is just. It, is it possible for a man to be able to, literally, be able to give? And because I'm assuming, if you got multiple women, you got to be able to give to them equally. Bro, or, I think, I think once again, 
this perspective of you have to be able to provide each and every one of them with the exact same money, the exact same. Bro, everybody's different. Mm. Some women don't even care about money. But okay, when so you talk, when you talk about love language, I mean, my goodness, let's talk about love languages. Like that sister just want just want you to give her a hug. That sister might want you to speak to her spirit. Like I, I don't know. I'm just I'm just saying that. Yeah. That at the end of the day, I don't have all the answers to it, bro. I'm just throwing out perspectives so that we can think about this in a different way. Yeah. Just because something is legal doesn't mean it's moral, and because it's illegal doesn't mean it's immoral. Yeah. I think that we I think we practice polygamy regularly in our community and we just do it badly. And let me explain. You have so many single black women, professional, get, they got all the degrees, all the money, you know, not, don't got the man, but they still have the need for a man. So uh, a guy comes along that is appealing to that woman. He says, okay, nice, I, I'll come by and we do it, you know, do what lovers do. And then he's got another girl that he goes and sees and another one and another one and another one. Everything's kind of in a silo Right. And, and what's unfortunate is that this man, uh, he has no, you know, he has no obligation to anybody. Right. He could just he shows up and we, again because you, you're determined to be independent and you're looking for a man like that to want to marry you. And a lot of men just say, I don't, why would I marry you when I have five of you already? And I'm mm. happy with those five. Right. And so he's like, well, I don't want to marry and get and get nagged to death. I'm just going to keep my five and I have no obligation because you're so determined to prove how independent you are. That means I ain't got to do nothing for your kids. I ain't got to come visit you in the hospital. I don't have to be there for you for the hard stuff that a husband would do, but I can be there for the fun stuff. And then I pack up and I just leave and I go to somebody else's house. And, and that's what I've seen, you know, and it's because people don't, it's, it's interesting. It's almost like because I don't know what you're doing when you're not with me, I just, it just never really comes up. You know, now, now if she sees all these other women and knows about it all, then everybody's shocked and upset and mad. But think about this. You got some guy that's a good looking man that's got a whole lot of money and, you know, six foot five and the ladies love him. Everywhere he goes, there are women that fall in love and see him as some sort of fantasy that's going to become her husband or whatever. So she starts playing that husband lottery that nobody ever wins. <laughs> you know, really, that mm. I, really, I, I just I mean, I've just seen that. I'm not saying this happens in every case. At some point, that man may say, you know, I, I think I'm going to pick this one. I'm going to marry this one, and that's going to be it. But a lot of cases, he never picks. He just says, okay, you can enter the lottery. You can enter the lottery. And everybody has to pay a fee to be in the lottery. And you know what that, that, that fee is, right? Mm -hmm. It means access to your body. And I think that that ends up becoming a little bit problematic and unhealthy because that's where you talk about people saying, I don't want to settle, right? What does that really mean? Right? When, mm -hmm. when I got married, I've heard that term settle down. Settle is not always a bad thing. Settling down just says, okay, I could have all of this and all of that, you know, but I'm just, so this is good enough for me now, <laughs> right? And, 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 I, and that's okay because when you say I'm not going to settle, sometimes I, I really believe <clears throat> it means that that woman is saying, well, I don't want the average guy. I got this guy down the street who's the mailman who loves the shit out of me, who just, you know, thinks I'm the best thing since sliced bread and he will be devoted to me. But because I don't want to settle, I'm waiting for this Prince Charming motherfucker who's got all the money and, and the good looks. I'm waiting for a man like him to commit to me. And I don't understand that those are two different scenarios. You understand? Mm. Those are two different people that have different levels of options. You know, when you have a man that has a lot of options, a lot of brothers that are doing well have a ton of options because there's so many beautiful, intelligent black women and they got money. You know, no, no, I would, so, I would so say it's, it's hard. I would say relative, because I mean, I think the polygamy conversation is interesting, but I don't know if it's as relevant because I just don't think it's that many men who would even qualify to have multiple women and then be able to actually have a union with multiple women and be successful. Right, right, right. But I, women I mean, women tend to be, um, and this is true in nature, they tend to be attracted to the alphas. No, no, that, I, I, that, listen, right. I, listen, I totally agree with that. What, what I'm saying is I just think that the, the man that's listening the, is likely the person that's trying to get one woman not mm. the person who don't have problems with women is what I'm saying. Right. So if for the for the guy who's trying to get one woman, and let's say he's already got some money, he's already got some decent relationships, but he's having issues with trying to not even get a good woman. He's just having women problems because a lot of guys, I mean, it's in sales now where guys are just literally involuntary not having sex. It's not a lot of guys. Like, is the average man is not getting laid, so to speak, like having <laughs> successful women. So how does right. the average man, even if he, so he has money, He's got a little bit of status. What can he do 
to actually improve himself or put himself in a position to actually secure a lady? I think if you, first of all, I don't, I don't think chasing women will get you more women. I think that uh, chasing your dream, your passion, I think being successful, I think be, being a decent person um, will go a long way. Uh, you know, understanding women, you know, if, if you, um, I, I saw somebody who said this and I thought it was great. He said that instead of me being frustrated by the things about you, I didn't understand. I changed my perspective and I started to study you and just kind of learn how you operate and, and what triggers you and what and everything else. Uh, I think that, that choosing the woman that you're interested in and studying her and really understanding her in that way, I think good women will appreciate that. And the women who don't appreciate that, those might not be the women for you. And so I think going deeper than just like, okay, I, I need to be with the baddest chick or whatever, like really thinking, like seeing yourself worthy enough, right? A lot of times mm -hmm. we, we see the person we're with as like a status symbol, you know, like I'm going to chase this, this, there's a, literally a book called uh, Men Love Bitches. And, and, and I, and the thing mm -hmm. is, I don't love bitches. I don't like women that are mean to me. Like I'm worth, I'm, I'm, I am the prize too. Like you're not going to disrespect me. I don't care how good you look. Right. And I think that everyone should sort of understand that, you know, and because women will do it too. Women will meet the guy who does everything for them, is as nice as it can be, and say, oh, he's boring. And then you go chase some piece of shit and, and then you get upset and you, you, you're an abuse survivor now when you knew that you were getting with a guy that didn't give a damn about you in the first place. So, so, so that, what that says to me is that that is a self worth issue. You don't see yourself being worthy of somebody who loves you. So you look at the man that really loves you and adores you. And you say, what's wrong with you? If you, love, if you love this, then you must be weak. You must not have any options. You must not be a good catch because mm -hmm. nobody would love somebody like me. Right. So, so ultimately, start with that self-worth piece. And I, I would say to the men, if you're trying to appeal to women, I think that uh, even things like confidence, <clears throat> confidence is something that you can grab and embrace. And it's something that's very appealing to women. And a confidence starts, again, with self-love. If you love yourself and you're pursuing your passion, like when D1 is in there doing his thing and rapping and getting on stage and, you know, doing all these great things he does, I see the women and their reaction. It's because I think women like that. Women like to see a man who is confident and passionate, and these are things you can learn. These are skills you can develop. But, but I think you develop them independently without thinking, like, I'm doing this to impress a woman. You want to just be the best version of yourself, period. Well, that's real, and I, and I would say that I mean that confidence piece goes so far. It's such a big part. It is such a big part yeah. in attracting women, attracting business partners, attracting so much around you because so many people can sense and feel that on you. And that real confidence, it truly comes from you even watching yourself perform mm -hmm. over time, mm -hmm. like you really keeping your word with yourself. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Like you actually no, saying you're gonna do things. You actually creating things, bringing thoughts to life. Yeah. You doing that, and, and over time, over and over again, it happening. Mm -hmm. I remember, I think it was um, in the, the, the book by, uh, it was by Kobe's uh, trainer. Can't remember his name, Tim Grover. Tim Grover, yeah. He wrote an excellent book. I think and he, he trained Jordan, too. Yep. He yeah. did train and Jordan as well. Too, I mean. And he trained D-Wade. Yeah. Yeah. He actually, they asked him a question in the book. They asked Kobe a question. It was like, man, Kobe, why are you so confident when it comes to taking that shot at the end of the game, man? Like, you just don't want nobody else to get the ball but you every single time. It's like, why are you, how are you so cool and calm in that situation? He said, because I already took the shot a thousand times before. Mm. So it's like those reps that you've taken, like you've seen yourself do these things is what really, uh, you know, draws true, real, authentic confidence. And we, we really do have to, really um, build on that as, as men and make sure we're keeping our word with ourselves and being real with ourselves. Because I, I think that's also a big part of the problem of why we're, you know, for a lack of better words, saying what you just said, I think we're settling to some degree in the wrong areas. Mm -hmm. Like economically, we're settling. We're settling uh, for, for, for uh, within our purpose, within what we, be, what we can become our potential is where the real settling is happening. Not more so, the women is just a fruit of that. It's all really just more so a fruit of that. And I wanna talk about this too, because more so on the solution end of the spectrum, when we talking about these families and all the things that we're lacking, it, the, the real situation is like you said, there's an imbalance happening. We don't really got a home with all these resources, with all the right people that's educated on all these things. So but because of all the imbalance that's taking place, so even when we seen the pandemic pop off, right? Parents were more so pissed off 
that they couldn't send the damn kids to school like it was daycare. Like, damn, I gotta watch. I gotta be with these damn kids. <laughs> no, that's facts. Like that, that's yeah. pretty much what it what what it was, right? But even, even their mate. The, the 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 divorce rate increased during COVID. Divorce rate. Now wow. you gotta be around these people. They gotta day. be around us. Wow. Like, like like that's what I'm saying. Like like it, this thing is some people revolve and some people evolve. So if you can go in a revolution and keep going in that circle, and expecting different things, and you're gonna keep getting the same results. What I'm saying is spiritual. The spiritual piece for me is so big because I think that we keep lacking that. We we want to get. You have nice jobs. We make money. That brother that you were just mentioning, he made money. He got a right. nice job. But he his spirit is lacking something. Mm. His spirit is lacking something. Mm. So he has to go find that outward because he don't have an inward. Yes. But if you look at school, they only taught us about taste, touch, see, smell, and hear. They, they kept out intuition, clairvoyance, and discernment. You got to discern if this sister has your best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. You have to have intuition mm. on what on how you're moving in this world. Yeah. So we we've lost that speak, we've lost that space. We marry off of image and not essence. Mm. I'm going to go back to the word settle down. Every part of the language about relationships is dead right now. You're going gonna to listen. You're going to mm -hmm. love this. They tell us to fall in love instead of rising in love. Mm. They tell us to settle down instead of leveling up. They tell us to compromise instead of compliment. So everything, every part of relationships, you're giving up a piece of yourself in order to be with someone. When mm -hmm. I need to be with someone who compliments me, I, I don't want to, I shouldn't have to compromise because if I keep compromising, there's no reciprocity. Think about that. I've never got in an argument with a tree because whatever the tree exhale, I inhale. Mm -hmm. And what I exhale, the tree inhale. So we always have reciprocity. So when you're in relationships that exhibit reciprocity, now nobody feels like they're being taken advantage of. Nobody feels like I'm compromising. Nobody feels like I'm settling down. No, I got what I would deserve. Man, she's amazing, right? I don't fall in love. No, we rose in love. And the reason why I think words are very important, and I'm so big on etymology, is because if we say, if we go to church every Sunday, a lot of our people, and say the power of the tongues means life or death, and then we wonder why our relationships are dead, look at the things that we say. If we, if we go to church and say, uh, a man, um, as a man thinketh, so is he. What, what are our thoughts? You, the society already knows that 78% of people are going to get a divorce. A certificate, the reason why the certificate make, means so much to me in the conversation, especially with wealth, they make money off our birth certificate, they make money off our death certificate, and they make money off our marriage certificate. A certificate is a bond. The prefix of the word bondage is bond. So we have these bondage contracts and, and that we have no idea that we signed, mm. right? And then we wonder why the outcomes for most of our people, not everybody, because it works for a lot of people. I've seen people married for a long time. And I'll be honest with you, if, if they're honest with themselves, they know, that the, they know the things that they've given up to stay in that marriage. It ain't, every day ain't Sunday, it's more, but hopefully it's more good than bad. Right. But you know the sacrifices that you did. The sacrifices that I made to play football, would I do that again? Honestly, me? Personally, you hear a lot of people say they would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't put my head on the line and my health on the line to go run up and down the field for an oppressor. Me, I wouldn't. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. NFL, CFL, it changed my life. It exposed me to so many different things. But would I do that again? I don't know. And if you ask most people if they would get married again after their marriage, they say no. A lot of, I, I know a lot of people that say no, but I also know a lot of people who got remarried. I personally ask that, and, and quite a bit of them say no. Absolutely. That's, I mean, that's what that's what a lot of people say. And then they get married, they keep getting married, but they don't understand, the, you've been married already. This, this is why I want to go back to the spiritual side. You've been married, bro, when you laid down together. Let's, like, we, we don't want to unpack that. Mm -hmm. Like, let's really talk about that, bro. <laughs> no, we do. No, no, we do. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying, does that yeah. not make sense, though? And what I'm, when I'm saying that, when you consummate with someone, you're literally considered to be married to them in the spiritual realm. And if we all know that the spiritual realm is the most important realm that we're facing with and dealing with in life, then let's talk about that. So now, okay, we want to come say we're married to the government or to the system. That's crazy to me because you know this is the same system that never has had any of your best interests at heart. So that's what made me question it. It's not about getting, I've never been in no coochie deficit. So it's not about <laughs> women, bro. Like, let's be real. No, for real. I, think, I just, I just want to say that. 
You know, I could have said the P word, but I ain't want to say that. You know what? But I'm not. I'm not in that. I take pride in turning down more coochie than the average man can get. I take pride in that because at the end of the day, there's no way you can achieve a certain level of success and significance in this world and be and let your vices take over control of you. Any vice, whether it's women or drugs or gambling or whatever we have that we deal with, mm. if you are too consumed with your vice, it will it will it will kill you. Yeah. Steve, I'm, first of all, just look, I'm convinced. First of all, dear future <laughs> wife, I'll tell you right now, you want to marry me, I ain't signing a damn thing. <laughs> well, you crazy? You crazy, bro? I'm convinced. Guys. No, I'm not. I'm not think, I, just, I just think. I look, man. I just think that there's. I think that these are conversations that we should have, man. And like, 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 boy said earlier, the relationship between you and your partner or partners is that it's between y'all. Yeah. And if we get to a place where we, like, we process information to the same, then we could really we could conquer the world for real. Mm -hmm. But what happens is if I'm I'm. If I tell you who I am and you don't believe me because you created an image of me in your head, or if I tell you who I am and you think you can change me, then we're gonna have an issue. Mm. And same for me, for you. If, I, if I'm talking about, man, I don't celebrate holidays, baby, but then I get mad that she put us up a Christmas tree, then I'm, I fooled myself. I told this woman that I don't celebrate holidays and she's showing me that that's what she's on. So if I keep moving forward with that, I'm crazy. Right. Mm. You see what I'm saying? But I'm not just putting, I don't, I hate when people project like, oh, my baby mama crazy, or the women say my baby daddy, was he crazy before you laid down with him? Yeah. Did you have That's enough right. discernment to know he was going to be who, right. who he already showed you who he was, but your intuition and discernment didn't kick in to see it. That's right. So now he crazy because he didn't acquiesce to the things that you wanted him to do and the person that you wanted him to be. So that's all That's all I, I am, I'm here for with it, bro, yeah. is the discussion of lifting the veil on the traditions that we've been given and, and just having a conversation behind it. How I live my life, then ain't nobody business. But I do have, I do think that we should start talking about if, they, if everything else they've lied to us about, why wouldn't they lie to us about this? Mm -hmm. And when I say they, I'm talking about the people who control society, the people who control media, the people who control the politics, the five power structures. Right, I call it politics because hmm. they've been tricking us. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm a theocrat. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm a theocrat, meaning that I go by God law. Yeah. God say, if it's cold outside, you better get a jacket. If it's hot, you better get some shade. If you plant a seed and water it, that's, see, that's the hmm. laws of the land. Right now, we are obeying the laws of man. And like I said earlier, just because something is legal doesn't make it moral. And just because something is illegal doesn't make it immoral. It's just hmm. whoever's controlling the narrative that that tells that story. You feel what I'm saying? No, I feel so, you. Steve. So yeah, I you know, I had to interject on that, bro. No, no, I get it. <laughs> I think it's a great point. You know, I I think that um that honesty piece, you know, I like that. I, I think that when they who was it, my angel that said when people tell you who they are, you gotta believe them. Yep. And uh sometimes we really think I, I give you an example. I was I was talking to a young lady I used to mentor, and she she had a crush on little Wayne. And I said, well, you know, Lil Wayne got three girls pregnant at the same time. Like, do you think you would have a traditional relationship with him where, you know, he's a traditional husband, monogamous and all that? And she said, um, well, maybe for me, he would do that. And I said, and so I, that's what I said, oh, man, we in trouble. Right. You're know, so different. Right, right. So, right. So, so, I, so I think if you, you know, I think the best way to really connect with people is to do that discernment piece. I, think about how many problems would go away if we simply took time to think about who we lay down with. Mm. You know, just a, a cooling off period. You know, let's say there was like a, a ruler that we follow where we said, anytime we want to lay down with somebody new, we're going to spend about a month oh my just God. getting to know the person, thinking it through, processing it. Well, you can't even be in the same room. You know, you ain't got to smell a perfume and look at, you know, and look at each other's bodies, none of that stuff. You just get to know each other. Mm. A lot of the things that end up disappointing us later on down the line would be revealed in that amount of time. But unfortunately, you know, sex is kind of this dirty trick the universe played on us where it uh, literally shuts down your intelligence level. It releases um, <laughs> these chemicals, uh, dopamine, phenethylamine, all this other. So literally when you are, when somebody touches you for the first time and you fall in love and, and or get close sexually, you literally are just like a crackhead. You're like on drugs. Mm -hmm. And it lasts for about six months. And then when you get to about eight or nine months in, that's when you start noticing all the other little mm -hmm. things that you don't like. That's and right. that's why you have some people that live in that cycle where they 
have these six six to nine month relationships Tyshawn. each year, you know, and then you know, and, and, I just mess with one. It's a repetitive <laughs> process, you know. And, and it reminds me of when I was little, and I would go to the store and I would get a pack of like bubble gum, like bubble licious or bubble yum. That's what it was called. And 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 you know, how you put gum in your mouth, and it's real good at first. You know, yep. you're chewing it, and the sugars. Are, and then after about 10 minutes, it's, it don't taste the same. Yeah. So what do you do? You spit it, it out. You go to the next piece. New piece of gum. And, gum. and some of us approach <laughs> love that way. Yeah, they call they uh, they call those uh, people like love addicts. Where you love, you don't really love the idea of being in a relationship. You mm. just like falling in love for the first time. Mm. You know, and so so maybe so so to some extent, think about that. So a person who's a love addict who tries to get married is gonna have trouble because that's like asking a sprinter to run a marathon. Mm. Like you're not a marathon runner. Right. You, you you never even saw right. anybody run a marathon growing up. You know, I saw my parents run a marathon. I saw the pain and the challenge of staying together for 50 years and all that. So I'm kind of out of mindset. Like, okay, this is going to be tough, but we got to figure it out. We're going to keep on running. Da, da, da. Whereas if you think life's always a sprint, like I'm always going to be happy, you ain't going to always be happy. It ain't, stop that. You know, uh, you have to decide if, if this is what you want to do. Spend time learning, number one, discerning, like he said, yeah. before th that person even gets access to your body. Uh, but then at that point, really thinking through everything and studying, just understanding what does it mean to make this partnership work? Because here's the thing. If you can make it work, then that is a, a, a massive, massive wealth hack. You know, family wealth, the ability to work together as a team and accomplish something great is extraordinary. But if, you, uh, if the ship starts sinking, and you all become enemies, <clears throat> and you're sleeping with the enemy every day, mm -hmm. and it, it's going to be a massive distraction. It will drain you financially, spiritually, and every other, in every wow. other way imaginable. So do it right. If, if we can't build together, together, we can't chill together. We, exactly. and if we, we can't heal together, we can't chill together. If I had to go to the courthouse when I met a woman, and I had, hey, Your Honor, I really like her. Uh, is it okay if I court her and date her? And we, you know, that would make sense to me that when we separate, or if we got a divorce, or if we went through a turmoil, it would make sense then to me to go back to that same courthouse to have that same conversation with this judge. Mm. But we don't have to do that. When you meet a woman and y'all fall in love and y'all do y'all thing and y'all connect and all of a sudden, man, I went from being that brother who you were looking in my eyes and saying I was the best thing since sliced bread to being the person that you hate. Mm. So now in the middle, a divorce should really be as easy as it was when we got together, but they make it so hard because as to, as to Boris's point, it kills our wealth. So now people, a lot of people stay inside of marriages and relationships because they don't want to be economically destroyed. Think about that. Because the person who has the most in a marriage certificate situation, that's the person who loses. Especially if they don't have a prenup. Of course, where prenups come in and you got all that. Well, I don't want a prenup. You don't really love me. if it, You know, all that. But, mm. Whatever. But at any rate, it's like whoever has the most loses. So if you're a man or a woman, I've seen many of my friends, sisters that doing very well, married men, and they took her to the bank because they really weren't there for that reason. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. I just say, dang, if, if we didn't go to the courthouse before when we met, why are we going after? We should have enough respect and enough love for the separation to say, look, whatever you came with, you mm -hmm. leave with, and whatever we built together, we bust it down. Mm -hmm. That's how it really should be. But no, we want to destroy each other because if the man is disgruntled and he don't want to leave, especially if you have children involved, if the man wants to leave and he's disgruntled, the woman is going to hold him children hostage mm. over him. That happens all the time, every day. If the woman wants to leave, the man is not going to take care of his responsibility with the children. Mm. Because if I can't be with you, well, damn the children too. Yeah. This is what happens. And so this, this is all based upon an a, a, a ideology and an imagery that we have in our head of what... Um, marriage and, and relationships look like and I just think we should start questioning that whole paradigm you know and, and start to try to maybe do some some things differently man that's I mean that's that's a lot I mean it's we, I, my my belief is something is definitely broken when you look at how many relationships fail and uh even deeper something's broken when you consider the fact that we it's almost like a luxury now for any child to have a father, a father and a mother that they see on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, uh, there was a young lady I mentored, you know, who uh, played basketball at, with a school in the hood, and I said, out of all, the, all your friends, how many of your friends have a father at home? And she said, mm, none of them. 
you know, and, and so in them, what you see is you see behavior from the kids that's just not natural. Like when you see girls and they're duking it out like dudes, you know, in the bathroom, you know, whatever, just crazy <laughs> stuff. It's it's a lack of, you know, father fatherhood and leadership. You know, yeah. it's uh, and and it's not a matter of a place in the blame game, but because we're all in this together, it take it takes a village to destroy a child. So I, I think that if we approach it by saying, well, it's 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 the men's fault because the men ain't doing this, or or it's the women's fault, da, 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 you're not gonna get the right answer. Because this is a system that feeds into each other. The women's behavior is a reflection of the men's behavior, and the men's behavior is a reflection of the women. So we all have to take accountability of this and understand that at the end of the day, our children are the ones who are suffering the most. And I see this on the south side of Chicago, kids just doing terrible things to each other, you know, and because and, 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 there's so much pain and they don't feel loved. They don't feel like anybody cares about them. And, and next thing you know, 14-year-olds are AK-47s are running around. You know, just yeah. it's crazy. Just stuff that's not supposed to happen. And I think it's really important that we really have these conversations about families and structures and whatever approach we take. We, we got to do it better uh, because we're not, you know, and, and some of it even starts with things like delayed gratification versus instant gratification. Instant gratification means I see a pretty girl, I'm gonna lay down with her. I'm not thinking about the consequences, I'm not thinking about the long-term effects, none of that. I'm just, it's like YOLO, I'm, I'm living for, for, for the moment. And, I, and again, I, I blame, I look at the culture that encourages this, Absolutely. it encourages everything from young kids getting high, high on dope at, at 17, 18 years old to just sexual irresponsibility. And then next thing you know, this baby's born and this baby comes into the world, their parents are already broken up before the baby's even born. You know, and we know every statistic says that child has a far lower likelihood of succeeding in life because they're going to be emotionally broken. Because, you know, mm. first thing they're going to realize is like, damn, my daddy don't even care about me. Mm. So that creates all these holes and voids that lead to behavior problems at school and everything else. And I ain't even talking about the poverty and all that stuff that comes from it. So we have to really think about this, man, because if we don't and we have to take accountability for it, if we sit around waiting for white people to fix this. We're going to be waiting forever. So so let me ask, I guess that's a good point to interject, because even going back to a solution, the reality of the situation is many of us are already in the situations. They already are reaping the the suffering from those decisions. They done slept with somebody they shouldn't have. Mm. I, right now it's a woman who's raising a child all by herself, mm. and she's trying to figure this out, right? So at that point, can you even give a sort of a starting point and some steps to take to put yourself in a position to raise a child that can position you guys to break the curse. Can I, where, where, can where does that, I, where does that go? Can I talk of that? Because I've been in a situation with my daughter's mom where we were not amicable whatsoever. It was real beef, real pressure to the point where I put myself in, the, in front of the courts. I was like, I pay child support to get her straight in my mind. When I realized that it wasn't about me being right or her being wrong or her being right or me being wrong. It's not about being right. It's about being righteous. See, we live in a world where certain things are considered right, but is it righteous? Right? If you take a righteous stand to say, no matter what you did wrong to me, I'm going to eat that for the betterment of this child. Yes. Now, I'm not going to I'm not gonna let you kill me. I'm not going to let you give me no heart attack, and I'm, I'm going to take care of me. This, you know, this, that mask, put on my, that mask first over my, but I'm going to I'm going to lay it on the line for my child. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to let my child know that no matter what mom says, aunties, uncles, friends, fam, I love you. And I'm here for you. And I'm vulnerable to you. When I did that, she opened up like none other. When I, when I came to her vulnerable crying, like, look, I don't care what I did. I apologize. And even though it, to me, in my heart, I knew my intentions were right. But I said, damn, being right, I'm about to be righteous. So whatever I did wrong, I apologize. I just got to be in my baby life. Like, if we start doing that, fellas, as the head, then we, we can change the order. Because some of these sisters will listen to you if you, if you, if you know how to do it in, in, a, in a divine, masculine way. But we don't. Sometimes you have to be wise as a serpent and gentle as the dove in order to get things done. You know, but we don't exercise those principles. Well, you remember, <clears throat> remember we live in a selfish society. Everybody's thinking about what's best for me and what am I what am I going to get? And I like what you said because you talked about putting your daughter first. That's the way it's supposed to be. The kids are supposed to come first, man. So that means that if I have 
I could really resent my child's mother, but if I love that child and I know my child <clears throat> loves their mother, I'm not going to say anything negative about his mother in front of him. That You will not win when you do that. Even if you're right, you, you will not win. You, you know, so the same thing is true for the father. When you are disrespecting your child's father and you think, well, if he, if he didn't want to be disrespected, he wouldn't have did something with that. No, you chose him. That child needs a father, and you might think you won. Like, well, now I've alienated. Parental alienation is a real thing. A lot of men are hurting because by no fault of their own, they've been alienated from their kids. Either they can't see them, or when they do see them, the kids don't respect them because the mother has a tremendous amount of power of laying out the framework of respect and disrespect. Whatever mama says, if, if a mama doesn't tell you to respect the teacher, kids won't respect the teacher. If mama says that your daddy ain't nothing, then, then the kids are going to pick up on it. Even if she subtly says it, you know, like, mm, that, 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 that. you know, yeah, the kids going to pick up on that. And what mothers have to really understand is, number one, that, that power that you have and, and being extremely careful because you might think you won. You might think, well, you know, his daddy is, a, he's an alcoholic or he's whatever, Ain't, my child don't need to be around him. So you got your child clinging to you for dear life because they don't have a father in their mind. But yet you've harmed this child significantly because now all they have is you. So you're getting all this overflow of love because your child wants to be around you all the time. And maybe you're lonely and that feels a void for you. But that child has to go through life without a father. And they're going to have all kinds of consequences that occur in their relationships, their personal life, everything, because the father is not present. You know, I knew a young lady like that who's real clingy with her mama. Mama was her best friend. Daddy was alienated. But daddy wanted to see the daughter. And this girl was suicidal. So she's clinging to her mama, but she's suicidal. And I'm thinking, probably because you don't have a father that really loves you and validates you on a regular basis. So now you are feeling these effects. You don't even know what you're missing. Mm. You know, so, so we have to just start by taking accountability, putting the children first, if you do that, then that will give you, that'll allow you to put your ego to the side and say, I, okay, I'm gonna stand down for the betterment of the group and for the next generation. If you do that, then I think things will work out a whole lot better than if you walk around with your ego attached to everything you say. That makes perfect sense too, because the, I mean, at the end of the day, the kids really are the long-term investment anyway. Mm -hmm. That's really what's the, that's the torch where it gets passed. Yeah. So it makes sense to just prioritize in that that where the trajectory is the highest yes. in that next generation. And I, I don't I don't think we put Naigo aside. No, I people don't, don't do that. that. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of the talk I hear online is very ego driven. Like, oh man, only you you you're a simp if you if you take care of a woman they got kids and all this other stuff. That's the dumbest shit. I, I, I'm personally offended because my father took care of me. He didn't have to do it. He was a handsome man. He could have been running the streets doing whatever he wanted. He chose to be there for us. And that made him an honorable person. Now I'm taking care of him until the day he dies because of that. I paid his house off. I did all these things because I love this man. I honor him for sacrificing for me in that way. And the idea that you, uh, I get it. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. But when you are telling 100,000 other men to not do it, and let's just, ab let's just abandon our community. Fuck all the kids that ain't got daddies or whatever. Like, you know, let, let's forget them then what you're doing is you're disrespecting every football coach out here that's, that's mentoring young boys. You're disrespecting all the men who are taking accountability for something bigger than themselves. I take tremendous pride in, in, in the fact that I, I have mentored a lot of young people that didn't have a father for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. I, you know, even if I'm only their father for 20 minutes a month, I love that. I love getting on the phone and giving them the advice that daddy isn't here to give them uh, because that's my responsibility to the community because I believe that as men, we have to understand this is our community. So when you're watching your community crumble and all this chaos happening, it's, it's, it's on you. Yep. You're the soldiers. We're, you're losing the war. What are you going to do to fix that? But in, in, and not every man's going to get it. And I'm not talking to every man. I'm talking to a few good men that are ready to take that torch and, and move forward. We, we, that's all that we need, period. That's a hell of a conversation. I don't think we've ever talked about stepfathers mm. because me myself I was I was raised by a stepfather and even now my mom has actually remarried since and man I love this brother <laughs> this brother here 
Like, it's so much that I know if he wasn't in the picture, so much shit that'll be on me. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much pressure that having men holding down the fronts over there, like, sometimes I call him, I don't even call my mom. I'm like, we good on there? <laughs> I'm like, all right, all right, all right, baby. I ain't, ain't want to talk. Don't even tell I called you. We good. We good. We good. <laughs> like, we just, we just handling it. And, um, you know, when I think about it, to be very honest, you know, boys, I'm one of those guys. I, I, I personally don't want to date a woman with, with kids, personally. And um, when I think about it, I, um, to some degrees, it, it could be considered selfish, being that that's how I was raised. And, you know, uh, preference, selfish, whatever. Different people have different opinions about it. But um, I, I must say, man, the stepfathers that is taking on and raising and providing man men in the lives of these young men that we 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 talking about is an absence of this. It's a it's a hell of a role. That's a hell of a role. And I, I must say, I, I have to, I have to respect the guys that take that on. And I think I think and I think it's perfectly okay to have the preference, right? And and you know, I, I chose to marry a woman that had children, uh, but I wouldn't have married just any woman with children. You know, I, I thought about the situation I was going into. Okay, how well behaved are your children? What kind of father do they have? If they, if, you know, mm -hmm. if, if she has some three crazy kids with three different baby daddies, I had to manage it. I don't know if that, that would have been a situation I would have enjoyed, but uh, but I can tell you, it, it's an honor to raise the children that are in our household. Mm. It is, uh, we, we're connected, they work with me, you know, they help me run my business now. Uh, their father is a, is a great partner in us protecting the children. The girls have double, triple protection now, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's beautiful, and the, the thing that makes it beautiful in my mind is that we all respect each other and we all agree the children come first. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So, so, so every situation ain't the same. And I do think that uh, women that do have children with other men, going back to what he said about how you, you do have these other husbands you, you know, that you've connected to. And if those men are not quality men and you're bringing that forward in your life, then that creates new variables that any other future man's going to have to deal with. So you're going to have to really bring some weight to, over, to, to compensate for that. Right, you, maybe you got to look extra but, but good. Boys, look at your look at your situation. Like you growing up, your your dad, your real dad, biological dad, was not present at all. Right, right. Yep. So it it kind of makes it easier to come in as a stepdad when you don't have to deal with that energy. That's true. Right, you know. But then coming to have to deal with the energy of the the father still present, you know, in these children's lives, mm -hmm. and now you stepping in, that's a whole nother dynamic. And I grew yeah. up in that situation where both my parent, biological parents were mature enough. And their mates were mature enough to say, hey, man, we're going to put all the BS aside for the betterment of the children yep. to be able to be amicable with one another so that these babies can have both their parents in their lives and boom, boom, boom. And it's hard to do that sometimes from an egotistical and an emotional for the woman perspective because, like, you know, there's sometimes when she don't want you to interact with your baby mama like that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you don't want her to act, interact with her baby <laughs> dad like that. But that's yep. just how life goes. And, yep. But it, but it goes back to the point of it being very difficult to, um, I think when you choose people to, to connect with in that way, you have to be able to know whether or not y'all process information the same so you can try to mm -hmm. eliminate those types of things from happening in, in the first place, right? But once again, life happens. People evolve. People grow. And so that I, I, I tell people all the time, if you've been married more than once, you've been a polygamist too, like even in the mm -hmm. traditional sense. Like, but we don't we don't have those. Once again, those conversations are so hurtful to people, and it takes away like the sting of like my re restart and refreshing and renewal. But it shouldn't. It's just life. That's what ha ha everything happens in life. We not the you're not the same person you were when you were 18. Facts. You know what I'm saying? You you've you've grown and you've transcended, and now who you are and the woman that you would date is a much different woman than the woman that you would talk to at 21. Yeah. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? So right. I, I say all that to say that in the midst of relationships, whether it's children, you know, your loved ones, your family, I think that when you connect to people who process information like you, it, it makes it, it gives it more synergy. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, if we don't process information the same, you could be my mom and I love you to life, but there's going to be a place where I'm going to have to either acquiesce out of respect, mm -hmm. mom, Boom, boom. Or I'm gonna go in and then it ruins the relationship forever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The disrespect or the disconnect of what, how we process things 
ruins it forever. And I'm just in a space in my life where just because I'm a lion, I ain't always got to roar. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, like just now, if you come in this lion's den, it's up. But just because I'm a lion, I don't always have to roar. I don't always, when me and my child's mother disagree, I don't have to always yell in front of my, I don't yell in front of my son because I don't want him to think that that's the only way he has to get his points across. Mm. But, but when we outside and when we training or when we in a space, when that yelling is valid, then it's time to yell, mm. right? But I don't want him looking that, I don't want him to ever see me disrespecting his mom. I don't want my daughter to ever see me disrespecting her mom in that way because that's not healthy. That trauma is only trauma that will plant a seed for more trauma. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But you have to be mature in that space because when my parents were 17 and 18 when they had me, so they were babies. So I give my parents grace, and I think we need to do that too. We need to really think about giving our parents grace, especially when they had us young, especially when they were not aware of the things that they were doing and saying because, man, listen, I'm, I, as, as a parent that's in my 40s who has young children, it, sometimes I'm like, dang, you know, even for me, and I have, a, I have a lot of information, but sometimes you don't have information on how to attack this thing in life when it comes to, you know, the gray areas with your children and people you love. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think that we, I, give, I gave my parents so much grace, and I still give them grace, and I, and I thank them for the way they raised us. But, but they were babies, man. Think, of, think about a 17 year I think about myself at 17 having a child. Man, that, that was, that was, I mean, that would have been awful. I, I, for I me. had a child at 17, or, eight, or actually 18. Wow. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. I mean, yeah. look wow. at all the, and now you have a child, You when you came into your, your stepchildren's lives as a parent, you mm. you had a different perspective on how oh, yeah. to, to attack mm -hmm. childhood yep. than you did when you were a baby yourself. Mm. Um, in Hebrew, yeah. a man is not a man until he's 40 years old. Mm. Wow. In wow. Hebrew, seriously, a man ain't a man until he's 40. So just imagine that. Wow. Man, let me tell y'all, y'all got something to think about this show. <laughs> this, I mean, if you ain't been challenged in your thinking. Something different. Man, this here, I know this episode has absolutely done it, man. I, I really appreciate y'all brothers for coming up here. I intentionally brought, I don't know if y'all noticed this, these are very different brothers all here <laughs> on the platform together. Very different perspectives, very different knowledge bases, very different backgrounds. And um, a lot of times, man, it's important for us to come to the table, one table, and be able to share with each other. And today, it was with you guys. And I appreciate y'all for giving me your time. The audience appreciate you guys for giving y'all time. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Hardly Initiated. We are out. <laughs> <laughs>